just stop for a moment and just say, Lord, 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 I'm grateful. Lord, Lord, I'm thankful. I'm grateful for whatever you've already done. Lord, I thank you for what you're doing right now. And God, I'm grateful for what you're going to do. Lord, I'm in your hands. And I'm grateful, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Thank you, Lord, for who you are. Thank you for what you have done. Hallelujah, God. I'm grateful to you. I'm grateful for your love, Lord. No one loves me like you. I'm grateful for everything you've done. given up <laughs> but Lord you never you never gave up any grateful people in the house are you grateful for what Lord the Lord has done are you grateful for what the Lord is doing are you grateful for what the Lord's going to do I just want to stop a moment and say Lord thank you hallelujah Lord, I'm grateful. Thank you, Lord. I'm telling you, we serve the awesome and the amazing God. There's no one like our God. And I'm just grateful to the God that we serve. Has he ever done anything in your life? Just one thing. Has he done just one thing in your life? Well, I want to tell you, before you woke up this morning, he got you here. Didn't matter if you were born to a single mama or not. God got you here. And guess what? God kept you here. And if you're going to be here any longer, God's going to keep you here. And you ought not be too stingy to tell God, Lord, I'm grateful. I am grateful for who you are and what you do. Thank God for who he is, the awesome and the amazing God. He just keeps right on blessing us, not because we're so holy, but because he's God. Not because we deserve it, but because he is God. And you ought to be grateful. I am grateful for the Lord and what he has, what he has already done. He is the awesome God. And I'm just grateful. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Call your attention to the book of St. Matthew, chapter 26. St. Matthew, chapter 26, verses 20 through 25. St. Matthew, chapter 26, verses 20 through 25. Thank God for who he is. And thank him for what he has already done. There's no God like our God. Matthew chapter 26, verses 20 through 25. When you found it, you will discover these words. When evening had come, he sat down with the twelve. Now as they were eating... He said, Assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. And they were exceedingly sorrowful. And each of them began to say to him, Lord, is it I? He answered and said, He who dipped his hand with me in the dish will betray me. The Son of Man indeed does, the Son of Man indeed goes just as it is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. Then Judith, 
who was betraying him answered and said, Rabbi, is it I? And he said to him, you have said it. I want to talk on this question, Lord, is it I? Lord, is it I? Have you ever had a real good friend that you thought would stick with you through thick and thin? Have you ever had a family member that you knew you could depend on, but they let you down? Have you ever had a neighbor who you thought that you could really rely on, but not only did the neighbor let you down, the neighbor went against you? Have you ever had somebody that you had totally put your trust in, but when the thin showed up and the thick got gone, that person left you all alone. You see, we can't put our trust in men. Matter of fact, we can't put our trust in women. And we really can't put our trust in children. We have to get to a point in our lives where we trust God and God alone. Friends mean well. They, they gonna hang with you they're going to do whatever you want to do while you're doing it. But friends will let you down when you need them the most. You have to be careful who you let into your inner circle. Because it is the inner circle that knows you the most, that will tell your business, and they will turn you over or turn you in. It is the inner circle that will always tell your enemies where you're located. It is the inner circle that you have put your faith in, that know you well enough to let the enemy know where you're headed. You see, all of us have circles. We have an outermost circle. We have an idle circle. And we have an inner circle. And we have an innermost circle. And in this innermost circle, you have to be careful. You can't tell it all, even if it's your innermost circle. Oftentimes, tell people when you have some secrets, you can't even talk in your sleep. Because your innermost circle will let you down. Such it is in the text today. Jesus had outer circles. Jesus had an inner circle. And then Jesus had his disciples, which made up the innermost circle. Jesus had spent 33 and a half years on planet Earth. Jesus has spent three years with these guys doing ministry. Jesus had spent three years, and they watched him change water to wine. They watched him raise Lazarus from the dead. This innermost circle watched Jesus cry because of the sins of the world. They watched Jesus in his humanity, and they watched Jesus in his godliness. You see, Jesus is just as much God as God, and he's just as much man as man. As man, they watched him cry. But as God, they watched him raise a man from the dead. As a man, they watch him agonize in pain. 
But as God, they watched him walk on water without a rap. As man, they watched him being born of a woman. But as deity, they watched him forgive his enemies. They had watched Jesus for some three years. They, Jesus told them his greatest secrets. Whenever Jesus spoke a parable, they asked him, what do you really mean? And and he broke it down to them. But here we are today in Matthew chapter 26. And if you look back just a few verses, you don't have to go far. If you look at verse number 14, the priests did not go to Judas to ask him where Jesus was. When you look at verses 14 through 16, Judas voluntarily turned Jesus over. Look at the verse. Verse 14, verse 14 says, For one of the twelve, called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and said, What are you willing to give me if I deliver him to you? Let me tell you, friends, friends are not friends when they volunteer you turning in. I want, I want to let you know this morning, my first point is there's a reality. My first point, there's a reality. And I got several points under this reality. First of all, we see Judas in the inner circle. We see Judas, his chariot, and he's in the innermost circle. And friends are no longer friends when they turn you in. Little boy, little girl, watch who you ride with. Watch who you get in the car with. Watch who you hang out with. Watch who you buddy up with. Because sooner or later, when the thick gets thin, your friends will turn you in. It's a sad day when your friend turns you in. It's a sad day when your friend betrays you. The Bible says that he voluntarily went and asked the question. He, he went on his own. Nobody forced him to go. He voluntarily went and told the story. And Judas knew Jesus. He knew when he prayed. He knew where he was. He knew what, what his schedule was like. And he voluntarily went to the chief priest and said, look, y'all, I want to know from you, what will you all give me to betray Jesus? This word, this word, this word betray, this word betray means to turn him over. This word betray means to turn him in. This word betray means to hand them over to his enemy. In Laban term, this, this word betray means to snitch. And, and I hear you. I hear you. You saying snitches get stitches. <laughs> the fact of the matter is, whenever your friend turn you in, you got somebody you thought was a friend. They've never been a friend. They, they convinced you that they were your friends, but your friend turned you in. Have you, have you ever been to court? But, you, don't raise your hand right now. Folks start treating you funny. Have you ever been to court and you were dependent on somebody to be there with you? And when you got there, oh man, I overslept. Oh, man, I got something else to do. It's because human beings do, do not support human beings like they say. Here it is, Judas. Judas, Judas went and asked a question, y'all. He, he went and asked. He went and wanted to know. Now, first of all, Judas wanted to know how much money you're going to give me. Judas want to know, and Judas and these, all these disciples, we many times blame it on Judas, but many of these disciples were worried about the money. If you don't think they were worried about the money, just look a few verses ahead, and you will find that Mary came and, and took her hair, washed Jesus' feet with her hair, dried it with her hair, and poured this expensive ointment on his feet. And all of the disciples got upset. They said, man, this woman is wasting 
this valuable stuff on your feet. He said, we could have taken this money and, and we could have taken this money and got a whole lot of, we could have taken this ointment and got a whole lot of money for it. But let me just tell you, they weren't concerned about feeding the homeless. They weren't concerned about closing the naked. They were concerned about the dollar. God, God deliver us. The reality is there are a lot of people more concerned about money than ministry. If we can get this amount of money, we will turn anybody in. And what about, what, what about 10,000? No, that's not enough. What about 25,000? Now they see some things in their, their sanctified imagination. They see their goals being reached because they've been waiting on 25,000 and, and they've been going down to the gas station telling the man to give me one of those pink cars that I can scratch and give me one of those orange cars that I can check. And if you're going to give me 25,000 just so I can say something about my friend, let me turn my friend over. Judas wanted that money. And the problem is that historians believe that Judas was, Judas was the one who was the treasurer. Let me look at the financial people in this room and see if they're more concerned about ministry than money. The fact of the matter is, the fact of the matter is, is Judas not only is believed to take in the money, but he also took up the money. Let me explain to you. Let me explain to you the difference in, in taking in the money and taking up the money. You see, when you take the money in and move right to ministry, I thank God that our financial team take in money and moves it right to ministry. But Judas was taking up the money. What it says is that every now, and Ju every now and then, Judas would stick his hand in the bucket. And it would go from the bucket to his pocket. Boy, Judas, there are some people that would do any and everything just to have some money. The reality is, the reality is, Judas turned him in for 30 pieces of silver. He turned him in for, for money that he couldn't even make it to the bank with. He turned him in for a few pennies, a few dollars, just because he wanted the money. Let me tell you, the love of money is the root of all evil. If you love money more than you love yourself, you're headed downward. If you love money more than you love your family members, you're already down. If you love money more than you love your health, you got a serious problem. Some people say, man, I ain't going to the doctor now. If I go to the doctor, they're going to cost me $25 before they even see me. People are more concerned about money than they are their health. It is for the love of money that we have evil. The next reality I see here and the next reality I see, not only did he voluntarily turn him in, he plotted against Jesus. I'm just talking about the reality. The reality is he, he not only voluntarily turned him in, but he plotted against Jesus. He made a plan against Jesus. My next reality I see right here in, in, in verse number 16, he sought an opportunity. Judas looked for an opportunity. It, it wasn't an opportunity that came to him, but he sought after an opportunity. The reality is, the reality is the fact that Jesus is already telling his, his disciples, I'm going to die. He talks about the Passover. He, they ask the question, where do you want to have the Passover, the unleavened bread? And then Jesus says, go to the house, go where I tell you, and then go into the city. And when you get there, you will find a certain man. And when you get to this certain man, uh, this man will say to you, come on in. In the midst, my next reality is, in the midst of a celebration, people looking to kill you. 
I, I said in the midst of the fun, in the, in the midst of the dancing, in the midst of the singing, the devil wants to take you out and he doesn't care who you are and he doesn't care who he uses. The, the Bible said they were preparing for the feast and they were preparing for the Passover and, and he said, go into the city and you will see a certain man and say to that man, the teacher, Jesus, the rabbi, the master, and, the master himself is asking the question. My time is at hand. When Jesus says my time is at hand, he's on his way to the cross. In the midst of the celebration, the devil will seek to take you out. And check this out. In the midst of your dying, the devil will seek to take you out. God delivered me from people who waiting on other folk to die. There are some people that's hanging in the cut. There are some people laying in the bushes. There are some people that's telling the doctor, doctor, you know, you've tried everything. We understand as a family, you don't have to try anymore. There are some family members that's actually starving their family members to death just for a dollar. It's those kind of family members you don't leave anything. For them to deal with. There's some family members that can play the role. And they can play the role. Oh my mama I'm so. Oh they can kiss all over. They can rub a forehead. But they already called the insurance company. And they want to know from the insurance company. Now, now who's the beneficiary. And what portion comes to me. <laughs> they, they've already and then they get mad when the insurance company says I can't talk to you about that there are people who are scheming there are people who are planning there are people who are plotting your, demand, your demise so they can get your stuff well Steve Harvey says it like this my children can look forward to all they want but baby and I are going to spend all we got. <laughs> the Bible says a good man leaves an inheritance for his children's children. But it didn't say you got to leave it all. You, you have to get to a point in your life where you face the reality that the next reality is you're going to die. Jesus says my departure is at hand. The cross is at hand. I know I'm being turned over. They already knew. They already knew that Jesus was going to die. He had already told them. He's already reiterated. Jesus is going to die. The reality is not only is Jesus going to die, we all going to die. If Jesus tarry, if Jesus doesn't come soon, you're going to leave here. It doesn't matter how you look. It doesn't matter if you are, are 80 and you look like you're 50. It doesn't matter if you're 50 and look like you're 30. It doesn't matter how you're built. You're going to have to leave here one day. You can cover that couch up with plastic. Another woman going to sit on that couch. And she going to take the plastic off. And she's going to say, look how she preserved this couch just for me. There's going to come a day, there's going to come a day, brother, it doesn't matter when you leave, somebody else going to drive that truck. And it may not be your family members, somebody else going to enjoy it. Sooner or later, that makeup that you never open. Folk don't care if you gone or not. They're going to say, ooh, this really would look good on me. You got to leave here. The reality is we are dying every day. Every time I drive and I come to a red light and I see a guy walking across the street uh, on a cane or a walker, it reminds me that we are leaving here every day. It doesn't matter how fast you can run. It doesn't matter if you Usain Bolt or not. It doesn't matter if you can run fast now. Sooner or later, as the old folk would say, your footsteps or your feet steps will get short. 
Sooner or later, you're going to hear the inside of yourself talking to the outside of yourself. Sooner or later, you're going to have to think before you get up. Sooner or later, you're going to have to roll out the bed instead of swinging your feet out the bed. You got to leave here. Here it is, Jesus. Jesus realizes that he got to leave here. Jesus realizes that he has to go. In verses 1 through 19, there's a realization. Realize that you got to leave here. There's a reality that you got to go. Look at verse number 20 through 25. Not only is there a reality, there is a revelation. A revelation is when you uncover the truth. A revelation is when you reveal what's under there. A revelation is when you show something that you hadn't been able to see. Jesus develops this revelation, and the revelation is one of you sitting at this table, one of you here is going to betray me. One of you, he didn't say one of the people in the world, he didn't say his outermost circle. He didn't say his outer circle. He didn't say his inner circle. He says, my innermost circle is contaminated with somebody that's going to turn me in. You see, you see when, when, when Peter and Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane and they came to arrest him, Peter pulled his sword out. And he cut Malchus's ear off. Jesus says, put up your sword. You see, what was happening is they trying to get Jesus killed in a midnight brawl when God has already set it up that he got to go to Calvary. Let me just share with you. The revelation is sooner or later you're going to leave here and somebody may betray you. Don't get upset. Don't get mad. Jesus says that one of you, and he's sitting down with the 12. Verse number 20 says, he was sitting down with the 12. The innermost circle, the 12, the 12 men that he has given his life to. I want to say right now, and the revelation is sometimes it's the folk you do the most for that are talk the worst about you. I think I, I think I said again, so you can tell the folk at home, because I know it's not anybody in this house. It's always the folk that you spend most of your time with, the most that you bless, the one that you spend all of your time, your money, your resources on. That one, that particular one, is the one that will mess you around. The revelation, the revelation, the revelation is that sooner or later, sooner and sometime is sooner than it is later. Little boys, don't, don't, don't depend on your friends. <laughs> because the revelation is they will betray you. The revelation is they will, they will betray you. And look at the second part of this revelation. Not only will they betray you, they'll act like they don't know they're going to betray you. Uh, it's, a, it's a revelation. It's a revelation when, you know, I, I, I watched this movie a while back, many, many years ago, called Sleeping with the Enemy. It, it, was, it was this story about a couple, and this couple were, were living together. This couple were married, but one of, the, one of the persons was turning the other person over, and that person was his enemy. Let me tell you, you don't want to play games when the revelation is available. Whenever it's revealed, Jesus says, one of you at this table is going to betray me. And look at verse 22. When they say that they're going, he says they're going to betray him, then everybody want to know the question. Everybody has a question. Verse 22 says, and they were exceedingly sorrowful. They were upset. They were sorrow. They were exceedingly sorrowful. They felt bad that one of them, let me tell you, you ought to feel bad. You ought to feel 
terrible if you're the one that's going to turn in somebody, betray somebody that's been there for you. You ought to be convicted if somebody that have given their last for you, somebody who stood up for you, somebody who prayed for you, somebody who fed you, somebody who been there with you, somebody that's been by your side and you mess over them. And I told you that people, people that are doing you wrong are going to do you wrong are already done you wrong. They will act like they don't know anything about it. Look at the, the disciples became sorrowful and each one of them began to say to him, Lord, is it I? Now, 11 of them, 11 of them had the right to ask that question. But the 12th man. I said a 12th man. It's kind of like, like, is it Texas a m that has the 12th man? It's the 12th man. It's the 12th man. The 12th man are the crowds. The 12th man are the people that support them. But lo and behold, every time a coach comes through there and does not produce, the 12th man bags away. Every time the team is down by 20 to 3 in the fourth quarter, the 12th man sits down. And they know to stand the whole time they know to stand. And when they're down the most, when they need encouraging the most, when they need cheering the most, then the crowd begins to thin out. I ain't sitting out here in this rain for them any longer. It's the 12th man. The 12th man, Judith himself, decide to even ask the question. In verse number 22, all of them asked the question. Verse number 23, and he answered and said, he who dips with me in this dish will betray me. The one that dips with me. Look at the other thing about this revelation. It reveals G Jesus' deity because he is omniscient. He knows everything. He is all-knowing. He is knowing before it even happened. See, we think we hide from the deacon and hide from the preacher. And some of us, like the woman at the well, hide from the missionary sisters. But Jesus knows it all. Jesus sees it before we even do it. Jesus knew who would be here today. He knew what time you're going to get here. You ought to be asking the question, Lord, is it I? The revelation is Jesus expects the best from those of us who he's done so much on behalf of. Jesus expects us to give it all. Jesus expects us to leave it all on the floor. Boys all over, the, all over the world, girls all over the world, coaches are telling them, I don't care if you don't win. They really care. But they say, if you can't win, leave it all on the floor. If you can't make it, if, if you can't make the, the final shot and take us into overtime, I want to know that you gave it your all. Jesus has given it all for us, and we ought to leave it all on the floor for him. Lord, am I, is it I? Lord, is it I? Lord, is it I that shows up 30 minutes, 40 minutes late every Sunday? Lord, is it I that got, got good talents, but I'm sitting on it? Lord, Lord, is it I that, that I know you've been good to me and you pull me out over and over again and I'm too angry and too stingy to raise my hand and glorify you? Lord, Lord, Lord is it I that, that have walked around and act like you haven't told me what to do? Lord, is it I? I want you to just sit a while. Ask yourself a question. As we prepare today for communion, Paul says, as well as Matthew says, as well as Luke says, that we ought to examine ourselves. We ought to examine ourselves to make sure that the world has not presented us stuff that we chase after more than we chase after God. Examine ourselves. Look deep within yourself and say, Lord, am I really studying your word like I ought to? 
Examine yourself and say, Lord, am I really spending time with you like I ought to? Examine yourself and say, that little bitty Bible listening that Pastor Davis has given us this year, I mean, I mean, it was, it was challenging last year, but he, just gave, he has just given us five little chapters for seven days. Are you spending quality time with those five chapters? And then, you know, Pastor David says, make sure you listen to it. But Lord, even though the command is to listen, have I gone back and read it and meditated on it? And Lord, since you've given me so time, to, so much time to cover these little five chapters, Lord, you know, I ought to be able to go back and read it, write notes, even if, even if I'm not to journal it, I ought to write it down. Look deep within yourself. Ask yourself. Are you enjoying God's fresh air and not giving him 100%? Are you enjoying God allowing your heart to beat and, and extend blood to every extremity of your body and you refuse to spend two hours with him once a week? Examine yourself and, and ask yourself, Lord, am I spreading gossip more than I'm spreading the gospel? Ask yourself, Lord, am I treating people right? I, am I obeying the, the, the golden rule? Am I treating people the way I want to be treated? Lord, am I studying the word and following the word like I ought to? Examine yourself. And I think everybody in the room can raise their hand and say, Lord, I'm guilty. Lord, I'm not only am I guilty, I have a, 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 a New Year's resolution, and today you're revealing yourself unto me again, and I've stepped away from my New Year's resolution. Are you doing your very best? Or are you coming up with excuses? Are you tired because you're doing more of the world than you're doing more of godliness? Ask the question, Lord, is it I? Lord, it, Lord is it I that, that want to have more fun than, than spend time having enjoyable time with you? Lord, is it I? One very popular preacher in the city says that he's never gotten drunk. He says he's never hung out all night. He says when he retires as a pastor, he gonna get sloppy drunk just to feel like, see what it feels like. Somebody said, well, he deserved it after 35 years. He deserved to get every night then. <laughs> the question today is, are we living on God's time and not giving our best to God? Giving our best through service. Giving our best through finances. Giving our best through our church. Giving our best through the ministry that we are involved in or we ought to be involved in. Ask yourself the question, Lord, is it I? I just stopped by on my way to the rapture to let you know God has no pew members. Everybody ought to be active doing something, and some of us are active doing things behind the scene, and that's what we are called to do, and God bless you real good, a heap and a plenty. Are you celebrating God? Are you saying, that, you know, I'm an introvert, and I don't celebrate like that, God? But if I follow you home, and I watch you as you listen to as the world turns, as the world spins. And I watch you as, uh, as, as all of the movies come on that you like. And you're screaming back at the television set. Or you're screaming at the internet. I want to know from you, are you giving your movies more than you're giving God? Look deep within. Look, look deep within yourself. And, and don't go and tell anybody else the preacher was talking about you at church today. Don't go, go, don't go tell them, oh, you missed a good service for you today. Oh, man, he was on your street today. No, I'm on your street today. 
I'm on your road. I'm on your boulevard. I, I'm, I'm here because of you to tell you you got to dig deep. And say, Lord, am I giving it my very best? Y'all hear the baby outside? Does he have more of your attention than I do? But you know what? The thing about the baby, Brother Turner, he giving it all he got. I'm telling you, he, he ran back and giving it all he got. I mean, he's giving every drop of it. My question to you, are you giving it all you got? Are you adamant as this baby is? Lord, I'm coming to you today. See what the baby is doing? He's shouting because y'all won't shout. He's praising the Lord because you won't praise the Lord. He's excited about the church because he ain't like this at church because he's tired of see people sitting, sinking in sorrow. That's why I always say bring the baby in. Let him do what he does. Maybe it'll catch on somebody. Are you giving God all you got? Ask the Lord, Lord, is it I? First of the year, first Sunday of February, second Sunday, second, first Sunday of the year, Lord, am I giving you more than I gave you last year? One professional basketball coach says, give me 1% more than you're giving me now. He said, he said, to, he said to his team, give me 1% more than what you're giving me now. And after they decided to give 1% more than what they were giving, now we talk about one of the greatest dynasties of all time. They won one game after the other because they decided to give it all they had. What would it be like if we decided to be adamant about it, to fill this church up with people? What would it be like if you just take my challenge of five people this year? Just accept the challenge of five people. Get in touch with five people. Let me tell you, the statistics says, and this, these are old statistics before COVID statistics. The statistic says 80% of the people in the United States do not go to church anywhere. They don't go to a mosque. They don't go to a synagogue. They don't go to a church. They don't go to a house of worship anywhere. And we show up every Sunday. Thank God you show up every Sunday. We show up every Sunday in a car that holds five and six people by ourselves. Are you giving God everything you have? So you have the reality. You have the revelation. And then you have the response. The reality is Jesus is telling them, hey, I'm going to die. The revelation is one of y'all going to betray me. And then you have the response. The response, initial, the initial response was to ask the question, Lord, is it I? The response, sometimes the response is not so we can hear the answer. Sometimes the response is because we're nosy. Sometimes we ask the question, Lord, is it I? Because we want to know who it is. It's kind of like church folk. We look at people who sits with who, who dress what way, and who's leaning on somebody. Whether they're stable, unstable, whether they had a bath, or whether they wore that last Sunday or not, whether they got a new set of clothes on, whether their hat matched their shirt, whether their tie matched their suit, we're consumed with stuff, and our response is not always because we want to know, it's because we want to be nosy. Look at, look at the, the text. The text, the text declares that he answered, whoever dips, who, he who dipped into this dish that I dipped into, whoever dipped with me, whoever dipped beside me, whoever put 
their cracker in the same gumbo I put mine in. <laughs> Whoever used the same bowl that I use, whoever put their, their bread in the same soup, says to us, sometimes people can fool you by their responses. People will tell you anything. I mean, people will volunteer to tell you anything. They'll tell you, I've heard so much lies since I've been a pastor that I just can't count them. If I had one sense for every lie that a member has told me about their commitment, about their service, about them catering to the Lord and going with the Lord, I would be filter rich. Ron Buffett wouldn't have anything on me. Look at, look at the text. The text, the text, the text asks the question, Lord, is it I? All of them ask the question, and, and when they ask the question, Jesus said, this is the one. Another reason why they ask the question is to distract you from the reality. People distract you. Let me just, let me just say this. You, you, you can count it any way you want to. Uh, you, can, you can call me Democrat or Republic, whatever. Trump know all this craziness ain't real. He just said stuff to distract you from that which is real. Prime example, can't we do something like put beach and, and, and Lysol in their bodies and then it just wipe the virus away? Now you think that man dumb enough to think that that's real. He's distracting you. <laughs> He's distracting you from the fact that he's letting all these millions of people die when COVID-19 has a cure. Sometimes people ask the question to distract you from the reality. You got to stick with the reality. The next thing he says, the Son of Man indeed goes just as it is written. The Son of Man going to die just like it's written. Peter couldn't get him killed in a midnight brawl. Jesus had, had already been prophesied to die on Calvary on a skull hill called Calvary, to die between two thieves, an innocent man dying in between two guilty men. Jesus was already prophesied to die on Calvary, and then they trying to get him killed in a brawl. But woe to the man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. You have to watch how you treat Jesus. I want to tell you, your response ought to be one that will lift Jesus. You, 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 ought to, you got to watch how you treat Jesus, and you have to watch how you treat Jesus' children. Watch how, watch how you treat Jesus, because Bible, the Bible teaches that God will always offend his children. He will defend his children. He will look out for his children. You just stay with the Lord. Don't get caught up in the distraction. Don't, fight, don't try to fight every battle. Don't argue about everything. The fact of the matter is, God got you. God got you. Well, let me say it this way. God has you. God, God got you. God, God got you. Just don't fight every battle because if you fight the battle, you will lose the battle. But when God fights your battles, he has never, ever, ever lost any battles. I would have, it, 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 it would have been Good for that man if he had never been born. What are you doing with Jesus? How are you handling Jesus? Are you celebrating him? Are you lifting him? Our theme scripture, John 12 and 32 says, Jesus says, in I, if I am lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. We ought to be lifting Jesus. I want this church this year to lift Jesus. I want us to concentrate on how we lift Jesus. That's why we ought to have an evangelistic component in everything we do. If you're cooking tea cakes, you ought to have an evangelistic component in it. If, you, if you're playing music, you ought to have an evangelistic component. Your idea is to bring people to Jesus Christ because if you bring people to Jesus Christ, crime will go down. 
If you bring people to Jesus Christ, disrespect will cease. If you bring people to Jesus Christ, rape and abortion will shut down. If you bring people to Jesus Christ, life will be changed for the better for all of us. Why do we witness? We witness and we lift up Jesus because we want heaven to be populated with people other than just the ones we know. And you have to cross cultural lines. You have to move away from that group you know in order to make a difference. Sometimes you got to learn, learn another language. Sometimes you have to have a different mannerism. You got to reach people for Christ. If we lift Jesus, Jesus promised that he will do the drawing. The question today is, are we lifting Jesus? Lord, is it I? Am I sitting on my rusty, dusty? Lord, is it I that's not doing what I'm supposed to do? Lord, show me what you've called me to do. And bless me to leave it all. Verse number 25, here Judas. <laughs> I, said, I said, here is Judas. <laughs> here is Judas is carried. Then Judas, who was betraying. My Bible said he was betraying. He had already lined it up. He's already in the process. This is his response. Judas, then Judas, who's already betraying Jesus, acts and said, Rabbi, Master. Teacher, is it I? You know, that's why I don't get too excited when people say, oh, pastor. Oh, Reverend. Because Judas approached Jesus with what we believe to be respect and honor, but he had already plotted out and had already begun the process of betraying Jesus. You know, Jesus is kind of short on words. He asked him, is it I? Jesus says, you have said it. Sends a message to us on how we ought to respond. Sometimes you ought to respond with just a look. And under your breath, you ought to be saying, Lord, have mercy. When people tell you stuff that you know already is not true, you say, Lord, help them, Lord. Lord, help them, Lord. Lord, deliver them. Lord, get their hearts right. Lord, Lord, help. Jesus says, you have said it. They say, Jesus, Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? You have said it. They whipped him and they beat him and he said not a mumbling word. You have said it. And it's only because we don't have to say a lot in order to say a lot. We don't have to say a lot. You can just look, you can just smile, you can just frown, and use nonverbals are just as strong or sometimes stronger than verbals. And here it is, this Jesus, God's only son, Jesus who has spread it the way for them, Jesus who has given his life for us, it ought to, it ought to upset you that souls are walking around unsaved. And when you open your life up to God, when you ask God the question, Lord, is it I? Tell God you want this. God, break my heart for what breaks your heart. God, break my heart to motivate me. God, give me motivation to reach souls for Christ. God, whatever breaks your heart, break my heart. Don't get upset because folk doing all the other things with their lives. Don't focus on their mess. Focus on Jesus in their lives. Don't talk to people about what they're doing, what they're going through, and, and how they're handling their life. Because you can't get upset because their sin is different than your sin. But Lord, break my heart for the same things that break your heart and ask the question Lord is it I Lord is it I that allowed you to die on Calvary Lord is it I that allowed you to die and be buried in a borrowed tomb Lord is it I that allowed you to rise up on a third day morning before the rooster could crow gave your life for me and rose for me and I'm not giving you 100% 
Dig deep. Ask yourself the question. Lord, is it I? The door of the church is open. The invitation is extended. You ought to come to Jesus. Just as you are. If you've never received Jesus as your personal Savior, this is your moment. This is your opportunity to get it right with God. We got to become like Baby Turner. But baby Turner is not going to let it go until he gets some attention. We all not let sins go. We all not let sin walk out in front of us without calling that man, woman, boys, and girl to Jesus. If you've never received Jesus as your Savior, this is your moment. If you would bow your head with me and invite him into your life. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life and make me a new person. Lord, thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. If you struggle with getting motivated, ask God, Lord, is it I and surrender unto him because God wants you to be busy with his business. If you're looking for a church home, I recommend the New Beginning Church where Jesus is the center of attention and the main attraction. Please let us know, inbox us, call us, email us, text us, Twitter us, X us, and let us know you want to be a part of the New Beginning Church where Jesus is the main attraction and the center of attention. Thank God for you joining us today. Thank you for, for being here. Why don't we thank God for who he is and what he's already done. We serve the awesome and the amazing God. We serve the amazing God. And God wants us to surrender everything to him. to surrender to him and you know you haven't been at your very best will you bow your head with me right where you are and we want to go together and ask God to fix it Lord we ask you now to bless us Lord we messed up we have not done our very best for you Lord we ask you to forgive us motivate us Lord Auction us by way of your Holy Spirit. Bless us to engage other people for you. Bless us, Father God, to give better. Bless us to serve better. Bless us, Lord, to witness better. Bless us, Lord, to be about your business. Lord, break our hearts. Lord, break our hearts. Lord, break our hearts. For the same things that break your heart. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank you.